A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindi newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar A's Academy for the date 10th of December 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. We are going to start our discussion with this front page news article. So yesterday around 10 p.m. at Mamalapuram coast, cyclone Mandas began its landfall near Chennai, and this brought more intense rain to coastal areas of Tamil Nadu. See the cyclone moved at a speed of 14 km per hour, and as a precautionary measure, over 15 flights from Chennai airport to several cities were cancelled. See as per the article. Over 470 personnel of National Disaster Response Force and State Disaster Response Force were deputed to high alert zones. So in this backdrop let us understand some of the basics about tropical cyclones its formation and its landfall. Now let's begin with tropical cyclones. See tropical cyclone is nothing but an intense circular storm that originates over warm tropical oceans and move over to the coastal areas. See there are irregular wind movements involving closed circulation of air around a low pressure center. So they are characterized by low atmospheric pressure, high winds and heavy rain and that is exactly why they can cause large scale destruction. So remember the cyclonic wind movements are anti clockwise in the northern hemisphere and it is clockwise in the southern hemisphere see this is due to the coriolis force see the coriolis force is an apparent force caused by earth's rotation see in simple words the rotation of earth about its axis affects the direction of wind here the force which is responsible for affecting the direction of wind is called as coriolis force and as we all know it has a great impact on the direction of wind movement see coriolis force is nothing but force caused by earth's rotation and it affects the direction of wind movement this is all you have to know about coriolis force and know that the cyclonic wind movements are anti clockwise in northern hemisphere and clockwise in southern hemisphere and this is due to the coriolis force Now with this information let us move on to see the conditions which are needed for the tropical cyclone formation. The first condition is that there should be a large sea surface with a temperature higher than 27 degrees Celsius and the second condition is that there should be presence of coriolis force and the third condition is there should be small variations in the vertical wind speed. and fourthly there should be a pre existing weak low pressure area or low level cyclonic circulation and fifthly there should be upper divergence above the sea level system so under these favorable conditions multiple thunderstorms originate over the oceans and these thunderstorms merge and create an intense low pressure system and this is how a tropical cyclone originates Now talking about the early stage of the cyclone see the energy that intensifies the storm comes from the release of latent heat from the condensation process see the condensation process occurs in the cumulonimbus clouds surrounding the center of the storm and with continuous supply of moisture from the sea the storm is further strengthened on reaching the land the moisture supply is cut off and the storm dissipates See the place where a tropical cyclone crosses the coast is called the landfall of a cyclone. But if the ocean can supply more moisture, the storm will reach a mature stage. See a mature tropical cyclone is characterized by strong spirally circulating wind around the center which is called as I. See the diameter of the circulating system can vary between 150 and 250 km. Here the eye is the region where it will be calm with subsiding air and around the eye there is this eye wall and here only there is a strong spirally ascent of air to great height reaching the tropopause see here ascent means rising see here the wind reaches maximum velocity in this region that is the eye wall and it may reach as high as 250 km per hour and torrential rains occur in this area see from the eye wall rain bands radiate 
and rows and rows of cumulus and cumulonimbus clouds drift into the outer region and this expands the diameter of the storm see the diameter of storm over bay of bengal arabian sea and indian ocean is between 600 to 1200 km so these are all some of the informations regarding tropical cyclones see remember as i already said the tropical cyclones dissipate and when do they dissipate when they no longer get sufficient energy from warm ocean water and how do they get this energy through the release of latent heat from condensation process so when this is disrupted or when there is no longer sufficient energy from the warm ocean water the tropical cyclones dissipate and we saw that while reaching the land the moisture supply to the cyclone system is cut off and this is the major reason why the storm dissipates and remember one important fact the place where a tropical cyclone crosses the coast is called as landfall of the cyclone now that's all regarding this article discussion in this discussion we saw about tropical cyclones the conditions which are needed for its formation we saw about coriolis force and we saw the process of tropical cyclone and its dissipation now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now for our next discussion we are going to take this editorial article see this news article talks about the food safety expansion see as we all know the national food security act 2013 provides a crucial safety net for around 800 million people and how it is doing it it is through the public distribution system but it was noted that too many are still excluded from the pds that is nothing but the public distribution system see during the covid-19 crisis the entitlements of the 800 million people were doubled that is from 5 kilograms of food grains per month per person to 10 kgs and this is the increase in entitlement but this increase in entitlement it did nothing for those who did not have ration cards so the author of this article is talking about this food safety expansion that is the subsidized food should go to all the persons those who are not having ration cards as well and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us see the reason for excluding people from such food safety measures and then we'll see how the issues are addressed by the court and also the government and finally we'll see some of the measures that are to be taken to address this issue but before that the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference please go through it first of all let us know briefly about this public distribution system see this pds which is expanded as public distribution system our targeted pds was providing a food security at the household level but the enactment of national food security act 2013 brought a tremendous shift see it shifted the approach of food security from welfare to rights based approach see right to food is not explicitly mentioned in the fundamental rights of the constitution but it is implicitly mentioned under article 21 so what is article 21 it is the right to life and liberty so under this article it is indirectly mentioned that right to food is a fundamental right see the eldest woman of the household of age 18 years and above she is mandated to be the head of the household for the purpose of issuing ration cards under the national food security act and this is a step towards women empowerment and know that the national food security act covers two thirds of the population to receive highly subsidized food grains highly subsidized food grains means food grains available at low prices okay but the population coverage has to be increased because even now there are many cases where people do not have ration cards see we all know subsidized food grains are accessible to people who has ration cards right so for this only the author is saying that the population coverage for the provision of highly subsidized food grains has to be increased now you may all wonder what is the reason for the exclusion of population from getting subsidized food grains see there was less coverage due to the fact that there is a freeze in coverage in absolute terms 
that is around 800 million see the pds coverage is determined by section 3 of the national food security act 2013 So what does this section 3 say it states that the entitlements of eligible households shall extend up to 75% of rural population and up to 25% of urban population see this cap it was fixed stating that the standard of living of people would improve over a period of time now take section 9 of national food security act It says that the total number of persons to be covered should be calculated on the basis of population census. See the problem here is that the population increase between 2011 census and today it is not accounted for determining the number of ration cards. Why is that? Because we do not have 2021 census yet and this directly means that a decadal update has not happened. and that is why there is exclusion in determining the number of ration cards and that is why we are rounding it and saying around 800 million people and this leads to the exclusion see this issue became very serious during covid 19 time at this time many who were excluded from the issuance of ration cards suffered a food crisis we all know how we suffered right likewise people who do not have ration cards experienced the worst So through a writ petition the problems and miseries of migrant laborers were taken to the supreme court so the supreme court also agreed the request to increase the coverage of the food security measure to a wider population and thus it directed the union of india to come out with the formula or any appropriate policy or scheme This is to be done so that the benefits under the National Food Security Act are not restricted to people as per the 2011 census. This means that more and more needy citizens get the benefit under National Food Security Act. Now this is the direction by Supreme Court. Has the government followed the Supreme Court's directions? No. Instead, the government filed a delayed response. See the response stated that since there was no latest census published the coverage remained the same and also the government said that for any increase in the population the act has to be amended what is the act that the government is talking about it is the national food security act the government is saying for any increase in population the national food security act has to be amended But like we discussed about the Supreme Court has already taken into the account of the delayed census issue for this the Supreme Court suggested a solution to use the population projections know that the official population projections for the year 2021 are available with the Registrar General of India but the government it has not considered this suggestion The government it followed the cap which it has fixed before itself that is 75% for rural population and only 25% for urban population and it has supported its decisions by stating that the per capita income of population has increased and it also said that the percentage of vulnerable population has come down considerably Now you think about it how come an increase in the average imply an increase for everyone it is not so right if there is improvement in an average basis then it does not mean every single person's standard of living has improved and this is what author is trying to say see so far we saw about the entitlements under national food security act and the reason for exclusion directions by supreme court and the government's response to the supreme court's direction now let us see what the state governments have done regarding this see state governments they are ready to provide the ration cards once the order for increase in coverage is announced by the central government and also know that though it is not a state's responsibility several state governments have used their own resources to address the issues faced by their people and this includes states such as chatisgarh odisha etc see they had tried to expand their coverage of population beyond the centrally determined quotas but the major problem here is that these beneficiaries that is who are excluded from the national food security act they are subjected to less entitlements when compared to the national food security act beneficiaries and this is the major problem 
So from this we can say that state governments are taking efforts to address this issue but there is a limit to which they can provide aids to the people right Now what can be done to address this issue see there should be an increase in population coverage as said by the supreme court and secondly there should be comfortable and sufficient food stocks see only if this is ensured then the expansion of the policy coverage is affordable by the government so this should be taken care of and thus the author concludes by saying that if the government takes actions as per the supreme court's directions then there will be an increase in coverage by roughly 10 percentage that is the national food security act's coverage will increase from 800 million people to 900 million people and this is nothing when compared to doubling of food subsidy that was done during the covid-19 crisis and the author also says that since the government's responses are not satisfying the supreme court should be firm in directing the government to do an additional coverage of roughly 100 million across the states see only then the states can start identifying the new ration card beneficiaries And finally the author says that failure in conducting the 2021 census should not affect the vulnerable population any more. And that's all regarding this article discussion. In this discussion we saw about the National Food Security Act, public distribution system, National Food Security Act beneficiaries, the reason for exclusion of vulnerable people from National Food Security Act. Supreme Court's directions regarding it government's response state government's efforts and the measures that are needed to be taken to address this issue now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now look at this article see the news is that supreme court asked the union government to respond to a petition filed by national commission for women and the petition it seeks to raise the minimum age of marriage for muslim women As we all know, the legal age for marriage is 18 years for women and 21 years for men, and the marriage below this age is considered to be a child marriage, and we all know it is an offence. See, under the Muslim personal law, the marriageable age of a Muslim woman is considered to be over 15 years. So the NCW that is the National Commission for Women argued that allowing this practice would expose Muslim women to abuse and harassment and the NCW also said that allowing a Muslim woman to marry below the age of 18 years is arbitrary and discriminatory see the POCSO act that also did not permit marriage below the age of 18 years So the petition by the NCW which seeks to raise the age of marriage of Muslim women is in consonance with the statutory law like POCSO Act and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let's learn about NCW that is the National Commission for Women its composition its objective and some important functions of NCW first of all know that National Commission for Women was set up in January 1992 and it was constituted under national commission for women act 1990 so from this we can say that it is a statutory body and what is the mission of national commission for women see the main mission of ncw is to enable women to achieve equality equal participation in all spheres of life see this will be done by securing the due rights and entitlements of women through suitable policy formulation and it is also done through legislative measures effective enforcement of laws and implementation of several schemes and apart from this ncw also aims to devise strategies to solve specific problems arising out of discrimination and atrocities against women and this is about the mission of ncw the first one is to achieve equality and equal participation and second one is strategies to solve problems faced by women now talking about its composition see the composition of ncw it consists of a chairperson five other members and a member secretary see they all are nominated by the central government now you may think is there a qualification for these members as yes, there is Firstly let us see the qualification of chairperson see the chairperson should be committed to the cause of women and this is the one and only qualification for the chairperson 
Now coming to the qualification of members, see the five members who are to be nominated should be from amongst the persons of ability, integrity and standing. And the members should possess experience in various fields like management of industry potential of women, women's voluntary organization, education, administration, economic development and social welfare. And this is about the qualification for the members of NCW. Now the qualification of member secretary. See the member secretary shall be either an expert in the field of management, organizational structure or social movement or the member secretary should be an officer who is a member of civil service of the union or all India civil servant or an officer holding a civil post under the union with appropriate experience. And this is the qualification for the member secretary. And totally, these are all the qualifications for chairperson, members and member secretary of NCW. Now finally, let us see some of the important functions of NCW. See, firstly, NCW reviews the constitutional and legal safeguards for women in the country. And secondly, NCW reports to the central government about the working of the constitutional and legal safeguards and also it recommends for its effective implementation by states and centre. Thirdly, NCW suggests remedial legislative measures to address the shortcomings in the existing legislations. And finally, NCW, it can suomoto consider matters of deprivation of women's rights and then non-implementation of laws and non-compliance of policy decisions regarding women. See, these are all the major functions of National Commission for Women. And with this, we have also come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about NCW. We saw that it's a statutory body. And after that, we saw about its mission, composition and the qualification of the members of NCW. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the functions of National Commission for Women. And with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now have a look at this front page news article. See, we saw this news article before itself, right? During that discussion, we saw the formation of tropical cyclone, the conditions for it and its landfall. But we didn't concentrate much about cyclone Mandus, right? So in this discussion, we are going to concentrate on how the cyclones are named. We have come across several cyclones and several names of those cyclones over the period of time. But now we are going to understand how these cyclones are named. See, tropical cyclones forming over different ocean basins are named by the concerned regional specialized meteorological centers. So, what is this RSMC? See, worldwide there are six regional specialized meteorological centers. And there are also five regional tropical cyclone warning centers, which is shortly referred as TCWCs. See, they are mandated for issuing advisories and naming of the tropical cyclones. And here, if you take India, the Indian Meteorological Department is one of the six RSMCs. So, what does this mean? This means that they provide tropical cyclone and storm surge advisories. And these advisories are provided to 13 member countries under World Meteorological Organization. Here, you have to know about WMO or ESCAP. So, what is this? See, in the year 2000, a group of nations called World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific decided to start naming the cyclones in this region. And this comprised of eight countries, which include Bangladesh, India, Maldives, Myanmar, Oman, Pakistan, Sri Lanka and Thailand. But later in the year 2018, the panel expanded to include five more countries. They include Iran, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and Yemen. So totally 8 plus 5, 13 countries or member countries of the WMO ESCAP panel. So what do they do? After each country sent in their suggestions, the WMO or ESCAP panel on tropical cyclones finalizes the list. See, these 13 countries, they recommended names for tropical cyclones which are formed in the North Indian Ocean. 
and each country gave 13 names so totally 13 into 13 169 names are now readily available for naming the cyclones now coming to india specific information see indian meteorological department while serving as a regional specialized meteorological center it is mandated to name the tropical cyclones developing over north of indian ocean which includes bay of bengal and arabian sea see here naming is done by following standard procedures for example the proposed name should be neutral to politics political figures religious beliefs cultures etc then the maximum length of the name should be eight letters and then the proposed name should be given along with its pronunciation and voice over also see the current name which is the cyclone manders it was given by the united arab emirates I have given here the table of names which are provided by 13 member countries. Here the panel members name are listed alphabetically country wise and then the names will be used sequentially column wise that is the first name will start from the first row of the column 1 and it will continue sequentially to the last row in the column 13 and then note that the table will be used only once. See this table it includes only one name given by each member country. I haven't given you the full table which consists of 169 names. Here I have given this just for your better understanding. So that's all regarding this news article discussion. In this discussion we saw about regional specialized meteorological centers and the WMO ESCAP panel, the member countries of the panel and the naming procedure and the conditions for naming a cyclone. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now see this article here, the news is that ISRO has conducted the hot test of scramjet engine. See this was conducted at ISRO's propulsion research complex at Mahendragiri which is located in Tirnalveli district of Tamil Nadu. And as per the article, the test was successful. See, this is the crux of the news article given here. Now, in this context, we are going to learn about scramjet engine in prelims perspective. See, to know about scramjet engine, you have to first know about jet engine. So, first of all, what is jet engine? See, it is an engine that converts energy-rich liquid fuel into a powerful pushing force. Here the pushing force is what is called as thrust and know that this thrust only pushes the plane forward and the jet engines they are also known as air breathing engines that is they get their oxygen from the atmosphere and there is no need to provide separate supply of oxygen for the combustion process. See there are three main processes involved in the jet engines. Now let's see them one by one. Firstly there is this compression process. This process increases the pressure of the air which is trapped inside the combustion chamber of the jet engine. And then secondly there is combustion process. This process increases the temperature of air fuel mixture and this is done by releasing the heat energy from the fuel. And finally there is this exhaust process. See this process increases the velocity of the exhaust gas and this helps in powering the aircraft or jet. Now this is the basics about jet engine. We saw that there are three processes and the jet engine converts the liquid fuel into a powerful pushing force which is known as thrust. Now before learning about scramjet engine, let us know what is ramjet engine. See ramjet engine is a type of air breathing jet engine that relies on the aircraft's forward motion to compress the incoming air for the combustion process. Can you grasp what I'm saying? Consider the engine is moving forward and the air is coming inside the chamber. And this movement or the motion is used to compress the air for the combustion process. And this ramjet engine, it does not have the rotating compressor. In the ramjet engine, the fuel is injected into the combustion chamber and then the fuel mixes with the hot compressed air and it gets ignited. And this helps in the movement of aircraft. Now I'll give you some specific facts about ramjet engine. See the average speed of ramjet engine is 3 to 6 Mach. Here the term Mach is nothing but the speed of sound. See the efficiency of the ramjet engine starts to drop when the vehicle reaches hypersonic speed. Here hypersonic speed is typically above 6 Mach and here only scramjet engine becomes relevant. See scramjet engine resolves this issue. How? Let's see about it. 
See the supersonic combusting ramjet which is also known as scramjet is a variant of ramjet engine as the name suggests it involves supersonic speeds of air and it is a variant of ramjet engine see the scramjet engine is an improvement over the ramjet engine see though it is an improvement it has similar features of ramjet engine scramjet engine also does not have the rotating compressor it relies on the aircraft's forward motion to compress the incoming air for the combustion process now then what is the improvement see the scramjet engine efficiently operates at hypersonic speeds and this is what is impossible with the ramjet engine see scramjet engine allows supersonic combustion here the speed is greater than 6 mac that is 6 times the speed of sound now this is about the scramjet engine see this is only about the basics of the scramjet engine ramjet engine and jet engine see basics are very important for upsc examination only if you understand the basics then only you can conceptually understand a particular topic so make note of all the points that we discussed today and with this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion in this discussion we saw about jet engine three main processes involved in the jet engine and ramjet engine and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the scramjet engine now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion Now for our next discussion we are going to take this news article it talks about private member bill now suddenly it is in news because yesterday a private member bill was introduced in Rajya Sabha by a BJP member see the objective of the bill was to implement uniform civil code across the country but the bill has witnessed severe protest from the opposition members in Rajya Sabha so in this backdrop let us quickly go through the difference between the public bill and the private bill See the first difference lies in who introduces the bill. See if a bill is introduced by any member of the parliament other than a minister then it is called as private bill. Here by the word any member it includes members of parliament of both the ruling party as well as the opposition. So if a bill is introduced by a minister then it is called as public bill. If it is introduced by any other member other than the minister then it is called as private bill. But remember both the public bill and private bill can be introduced in either house of the parliament that is both in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha now this is the first difference now the second difference lies in the objective of the bill usually the public bill reflects the policies of the government that is the ruling party while the private bill reflects the stand of opposition party on public matter some of the examples include unemployment allowance bill 2019 See, it sought to provide an allowance to all of the unemployed people. The second example is financial assistance to unemployed post graduates bill 2019, and this bill restricted the unemployment allowances to unemployed post graduates only. So, like this, many bills are there which reflects the stand of opposition party on public matter, and this is the second difference, which is the objective of the bill. and the third difference is with respect to admissibility of the bill see the admissibility that is the permission to be discussed is decided by chairman of rajya sabha and speaker in the case of lok sabha and the house secretariat examines it for compliance with the constitutional provisions and rules on legislation before listing it see roughly the procedure is same for both the houses The member must give at least a month's notice before the bill can be listed for introduction. Now here also there is a difference. If a public bill is introduced, then its introduction in the house requires only 7 days notice. But the private member bill, its introduction in the house requires 1 month's notice. And apart from this, there is also one more difference see a government bill can be introduced and discussed on any day but a private members bill is only discussed and introduced on fridays see the number of private member bills has been restricted to 3 per session of parliament so these are all some of the major differences that you have to know about private member bill and public bill Remember these points take note of it it will be very useful for you to mention it where where it is required with this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion in this article we saw about the differences between the public bill and private bill 
the first difference that we saw is with regards to introduction of bill the second difference is objective of the bill and the third difference is admissibility of the bill now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now let us take up this news article for our discussion the news is that yesterday the supreme court collegium has approved the proposal for appointment of three additional judges as permanent judges in the kerala high court and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let's learn about additional and acting judges of the high court first of all know that article 224 of the constitution deals with the appointment of additional judges and acting judges for the high court so whenever you think about additional judges and acting judges of high court you should remember article 224 we'll see what is this article 224 in this discussion first of all let us take clause 1 of article 224 see clause 1 provides for the appointment of additional judges it says that the president may appoint duly qualified persons to be as additional judges of the high court now when are they appointed see if the president feels that there is any temporary increase in the business of high court or if there are any arrears of work then the additional judges are appointed by the president see know that additional judges are appointed for a period as specified by the president and also remember as per clause 1 of article 224 the term of additional judges should not exceed 2 years so the president is obliged to appoint additional judges for a period not exceeding 2 years and this is about clause 1 now coming to clause 2 it provides for the appointment of acting judges of the high court and these acting judges they are also appointed by the president now when are the acting judges appointed see they are appointed in three situations now we'll see the situations one by one firstly when there is an absence of the judge of the high court other than the chief justice of that high court okay if there is any absence of chief justice of high court acting judges cannot be appointed but if there is an absence of judge of the high court then the acting judges are appointed the second situation is that if the judge of high court for any reason unable to perform the duties of his office then the acting judges are appointed now thirdly there is this situation where a permanent judge of the high court is appointed temporarily as the chief justice of high court now what does this mean this means that high court is having one less judge because a judge is acting temporarily as the chief justice of high court so at this time an acting judge will be appointed so these are the three situations when acting judges are appointed see if these three situations arise then the acting judges are appointed by the president and know that the acting judges will remain in office until the permanent judge resumes his duties and this is about clause 2 of article 224 Now coming to clause 3 it says that the additional judge or the acting judge of high court shall hold office till the age of 62 years so they cease to hold office after attaining the age of 62 years so you know that this is a general condition and what about the specific conditions regarding additional and acting judges see in case of additional judges the term should not exceed 2 years and in case of acting judges they will remain in office until the permanent judge of the high court resumes his duties so that's all regarding this news article discussion in this discussion we saw about additional judges appointment and some of the conditions related to it and we also saw about acting judges and the three situations when the acting judges are appointed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now see this final news article here it talks about three medicinal plant species that are found in the himalayas and as per the article these three medicinal plant species have made it to the iucn red list of threatened species after the recent assessment So now we'll see the species and its category in IUCN red list. The first one is Mesotrophus pellita and it is assessed as critically endangered. The second one is Fritillaria cirrhosa and it is assessed as vulnerable and the third one is Dactylo rhiza hatagire and it is assessed as endangered. See the first plant species is Mesotrophus pellita. It is commonly known as patwa. See it is a perennial shrub with restricted distribution that is endemic to Uttarakhand. 
See, the essential oil extracted from the leaves of these species possesses strong antioxidants and it can be a promising natural substitute for synthetic antioxidants in pharmaceutical industries. And this is the significance of this plant species. See, the study stated that the species is listed as critically endangered based on its limited area of occupancy, that is less than 10 square kilometer. And the study also stated that the species is threatened by deforestation, habitat fragmentation and forest fires. Now this is about Mesotrophus pellita. And the second plant species is Fritillaria cirrhosa. See it is also known as Himalayan fritillary. It is a perennial bulbous herb. Bulbous in the sense round bulky. Okay. See in China the species is used for the treatment of bronchial disorders and pneumonia. And the plant is also a strong cough suppressant. See, regarding this plant, the study stated that it is reasonable to conclude a decline of at least 30% of its population over the assessment period, that is 22 to 26 years. And considering the rate of decline, long generation length, poor germination potential, high trade value, extensive harvesting pressure and illegal trade, the species is listed as vulnerable. So these are the reasons why Fritillaria cirrhosa is listed as vulnerable. And this is about the second species. And the third listed species is Dactylorhiza hetagirae. See, it is known as Salampanja. It is extensively used in Ayurveda, Siddha, Unani and other alternative systems of medicine to cure dysentery, gastritis, chronic fever, cough and stomach aches. And this is the significance of Salampanja. See, this plant species is threatened by habitat loss, livestock grazing, deforestation and climate change. And that is exactly why it is listed as endangered under IUCN Red List. Now, this is about the news article given here. Now, additionally, we will also see about the IUCN Red List categories and criteria. Now, what are the IUCN Red List categories? See, the IUCN Red List categories, they indicate how close a species is to become extinct. So, each and every category indicates how close the species is moving towards extinct. See, there are nine Red List categories. They are extinct, extinct in the wild, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, least concern, data deficient, not evaluated. See, species in the vulnerable, endangered and critically endangered categories are collectively described as threatened categories. And know that there are five broad criteria based on which these species are categorized as vulnerable, endangered and critically endangered. See, those criteria are given in this image from A to E. Now, the first criteria is population detection. The second one is restricted geographic range. And the third one is small population size and decline. And the fourth one is very small or restricted population. And the fifth one is extinction probability analysis. Know that species are assessed against these five criteria and these criteria only determine which category is the most appropriate for the assessed species. See, the deciding factor here is the numerical thresholds. See, there will be numerical thresholds like if a particular species undergoes this much percentage of reduction in population, then it will be included in vulnerable. Or if it undergoes a higher percentage of reduction in population, then it will be included in endangered. Like this, there will be numerical thresholds based on which the most appropriate category for the species is decided. And this is about the basics of IUCN red list categories and criteria for the threatened categories. Now we'll see about the remaining categories in the coming discussions. And with this we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion we saw about three Himalayan plant species which are medicinal plants which are listed under IUCN red list of threatened species. The first one is Mesotrophus pellita and the second one is Fritillaria cirrhosa. And the third one is Dactylorhiza hategirae. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the IUCN red list categories and the criteria for the threatened categories, which is nothing but vulnerable, endangered and critically endangered. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the discussion, that is the practice prelims question discussion. 
today we have five questions for discussion i'll solve four of them and one of them is a quiz question for you now let us solve this first question with reference to national commission for women consider the following statements statement 1 it was set up in the year 1992 as a constitutional body see this statement is incorrect it was set up in the year 1992 but as a statutory body we saw in our discussion itself right it was constituted under the national commission for women act 1990 so statement 1 is incorrect now coming to statement 2 the chairman and the members of the commission are nominated by the government of india this is correct this also we saw in the discussion now statement 3 the report submitted by the commission are binding on the government this statement is incorrect see the national commission for women only has the powers to recommend amendments it also submit reports to the government but they are not binding on them know that they are not binding on both the states and union governments now what has the question asked the question has asked for the incorrect statements we found that statement 1 and 3 are incorrect so the correct answer to this question is option c 1 and 3 only now moving on to the next question consider the following statements regarding cyclones statement 1 The cyclone circulates in an anti-clockwise direction in the northern hemisphere. Statement 2, anti-cyclone rotates in clockwise direction in the northern hemisphere. See, cyclones are rapid inward air circulation around a low pressure area. Whereas, if you take anti-cyclones, it is the opposite of a cyclone. It has an outward spiraling air circulation around a high pressure center. Now look at the table here. It shows the pattern of wind direction in cyclone and anti-cyclone. See these points they come under static portion you have to remember each and every fact okay so please take note of it the pressure system cyclone it has low pressure center and in the northern hemisphere it circulates in anti clockwise direction and in the southern hemisphere it circulates in the clockwise direction whereas the anti cyclone pressure system it has high pressure center and in the northern hemisphere it circulates in the clockwise direction and in the southern hemisphere it circulates in the anti clockwise direction So from this what do we know we know that both the statements given in this question are correct so the correct answer is option C both 1 and 2 only now moving on to the next question see this is a previous question which was asked in the year 2017 with reference to the parliament of india consider the following statements statement 1 a private member bill is a bill presented by a member of parliament who is not elected but only nominated by the president of india see this statement is wrong because in the discussion itself we saw that private member bill can be introduced by any member of the parliament other than the minister so it includes members of parliament both of the ruling party as well as the opposition so it includes elected members as well so the statement one is incorrect now statement two recently a private member bill has been passed in the parliament of india for the first time in its history see the first private member bill which was passed was the muslim vox bill and it was introduced by syed mohammed ahmed kasmi in the year 1952 and know that till now 14 private member bills were passed in the parliament since independence and the last private member bill passed by the parliament was supreme court enlargement of criminal appellate jurisdiction bill in the year 1970 So the second statement which says recently a private member bill has been passed in the year 2017 was incorrect. So what is the correct answer to this question? It is option D neither one nor two. Now coming to the fourth question with reference to the ad hoc judges of Supreme Court consider the following statements. Statement 1 Article 127 of the Constitution empowers the Chief Justice of India to appoint the qualified person as ad hoc judge of the Supreme Court. See this statement is correct. There is this term called ad hoc judges. They are appointed for specific purposes. And know that the appointment of the ad hoc judges is for a temporary period only. Now moving on to the second statement, no previous consent of the president is required to appoint the ad hoc judge. This statement is incorrect. See here for the appointment of ad hoc judge, previous consent of the president is required. Apart from this, consultation with chief justice of the high court is also needed where the ad hoc judge belongs. So this means that if a judge who is going to be appointed as ad hoc judge belongs to a particular high court, then the chief justice of that high court should be consulted. So the statement saying no previous consent of the president is required for the appointment of ad hoc judges is incorrect. Now coming to statement 3, the ad hoc judges can be appointed at any time to the Supreme Court. 
See the ad hoc judges can be appointed by the Chief Justice of India if there is no quorum available to hold or continue any session of the Supreme Court. So what does this mean? This means that ad hoc judges cannot be appointed at any time. If there is no quorum of judges of the Supreme Court, then only the ad hoc judges are appointed. So the statement 3 is also incorrect. And what has the question asked here? It has asked for the incorrect statements. So the correct answer to this question is option B, 2 and 3 only. And this final question is the quiz question for you. Think about it and carefully attempt the question and post your answer in the comment section. Aspirants, I have displayed here mains questions for your practice. So interested people, write it and post your answer in the comment section. And if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. And with this we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankaray's Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.